Let's keep in touch. Let's keep in touch. Keep in touch with me. Drop me a line any old time. You know. Hi, I'm Mel. And I'm Amy. Welcome to Talk to Us at Bounce English. Hey, Mel, who do we have with us today? Joy McFarland is with us today, and she is the product marketing manager for U.S. and Canada for National Geographic Learning. I first met Joy through when I was at English USA in, I think it was January or February of 2019, and we discovered that we had a wonderful friend in common, uh, which was when I knew that Joy was a very special person, uh, but I didn't know how special at the time, um, oh, because... <laughs> Well, it's true because uh, what I've one thing that I have learned about you in the time that I've known you is that you have a huge enthusiasm for the field of English language teaching and learning. And, um, you know, you are someone who it, it's so funny because so many people dread conferences. Oh my but God, that is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they are my favorite thing in the world, <laughs> even virtual. I, <laughs> but, you know, actually, the virtual ones are not so bad either. I'm really happy to have you here today. And happy right to be here. <laughs> yay. Um, and right before we got into it, you mentioned that your role isn't quite with National Geographic, as I think Amy said, crawling on your belly through the Amazon, like, yeah, <laughs> perfect shot. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your role? Absolutely. Yeah, I have. I was friends, um, very good friends with with the local sales representative for National Geographic Learning for many years. You know, we worked together on conferences locally and she sold me books and um, as when I was a school director and she warned me about that when I came over to, to the company. She said, you know, when you say what you do, people don't hear anything past the title because they have this association with the magazine and with the brand that they, in, they automatically picture you in the Amazon and with polar bears, like at the same time. And that's what your job is in their mind. <laughs> and I have found that to be absolutely true. <laughs> um, but in, in the world of, of English language publishing, we I actually work for a company called Cengage, which is one of the um, premier educational publishers in the US and around the world. And we have an agreement in the ELT area and in the K-12 area with National Geographic, with the society in DC to be able to use their content. So to access their explorers, the people that go out and explore the world, to access their photographs and to access their videos in order to create our materials. So we, I work for Cengage Publishing, but we are a division and we, we do use the National Geographic brand and name in our, in our logo and, and in our name. So tell us a little bit about your background. How did you, I mean, you kind of talked about your friend, but kind of tell us, how did you end up in this field? You know, yeah. I feel like people who do often have a very interesting story. It's so true. I, there is no one who in our, you know, generation woke up one day and said, I want to work in international ed. It is a degree <laughs> now, but when we were all younger, this wasn't a degree path. It wasn't a study path. It wasn't, you know, I always say, oh God, these accrediting bodies, someday we're not going to be qualified to run the schools that we all ran, you know, because they're going to need a degree in international ed and none of us have them <laughs> mm. because we didn't have that. So yeah, it's a great question. The long story short is I studied um, Spanish in school and I studied, I did some abroad programs in high school. I was fortunate to grow up in Mena, Massachusetts, where our public school system had some exchange programs and I fell in love with the language of Spanish studied in Mexico, visited Spain, and knew that that was what I wanted to pursue. I finished and minored in French in college and was lucky enough to go abroad on their American University abroad programs. And they strongly encouraged study abroad, not once, many times. Um, and so I ended up in Madrid and ended up staying and um, was lucky enough to get involved with a group of people that really, they, they taught us when we were their students with love and just passion for learning and learning the area, learning the country. And they taught us so well that I actually was able to survive there as though I were from there, you know, for many, many years. And I lived there for 12 years. I finished my master's through Boston College, but in Spain. And I ended up, you know, turns out that a Spanish major in Spain and education 
they already have a lot of knowledge of Spanish, so they don't really need Spanish teachers as much as you may think. So <laughs> the next best thing, as always in this industry, I fell into it accidentally and I was hired as an ESL teacher, definitely learned every night the night before, studied it, you know, the night before, then did a TEFL later, but, um, you know, learned a relative clause the night before I had to teach it. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> you um, know, it's, it's later. funny you, you say that because <laughs> uh, two things. One, when I was a new teacher, I was very intimidated by all of the other teachers who seemed to breeze in oh, yeah. every morning at about five minutes <laughs> before the start of their class and they they seemed to know exactly what they were doing mm -hmm. i now know they probably didn't but at the time <laughs> i found it yeah. very intimidating so oh, the school yeah. i taught at <laughs> closed at three i would frequently be there until about six meticulously planning my lessons absolutely specifically <laughs> so i could breeze in the next morning and look like and look I knew exactly what I was Exactly. Doing. It does get easier, you know, because then you prep that lesson. Once you've taught it a few times, the next year you pull yeah. it out and yes, you can breathe in, you know, by year five. Eventually, yes. <laughs> yes. But absolutely. And, and, um, and I was lucky enough to work in many different kind of ESL roles, fell in love with test prep, did a lot of test preparation, Cambridge exams, TOEFL, IELTS. And then um, I actually founded, co-founded and, and ran a language school in the Madrid area for years and then moved back here to the U.S., found out that this was a career here as well and helped to run some chain um, ESL private language schools. That's where I met your, our mutual friends <laughs> and, and got to serve on some amazing organizations. Um, I was, as you mentioned, we met at English USA. I was part of the executive board, the national board for English USA. And just, as you said, I love conferences. So founded a conference here for MATSAL, the Massachusetts branch of TESOL for private language schools and IEPs. And, you know, just anything that brings your peers together in, in the international education world to collaborate and to share and to make ourselves better is pretty much my absolute favorite thing. And so now I have a job where I am like a professional conference goer. I get to go to a lot of conferences representing National Geographic Learning and going to the same events that I used to go to as a customer. And it really helps me to connect, I feel like, with customers because I've taught with these books. I completely know where they are because I was them. And I still, like, that's who I feel like I am when I wake up in the morning. I still totally understand that. So it's, it's really fun. You know, it's just so fun to see another part of the industry. So I think a lot of people who might be listening, you know, might be thinking, oh gosh, you know, I would love to make that leap. I'd love to make that yeah. leap from teaching or mm -hmm. even working as an administrator yep. to a more publishing or marketing type role. Do you have any suggestions or advice? Yeah, absolutely. I do. That's a great question, Melanie. I think that is true. Um, you know, a group of friends and I were planning to present at TESOL this past year and we decided to postpone. They gave us the choice when it was, when it went virtual to postpone, but we had a panel that was accepted and it's called in quotation marks, jokingly, when I got a real job, because as most <laughs> of you know, in yes. the ESL world, when a teacher leaves your school and you're the director and you're sitting there and you're sad to lose them and you say, what, what happened? Where are you going? And they go, you know, I, I got really a real need to job. get a real job. And <laughs> it's so frustrating because on the one hand, yeah, until we start to treat ESL administrators and teachers as though it were a real job and actually give them full benefits and treat yeah. them like the amazing professionals they are. I get Preach. why people say it. It's, it's so frustrating, but you know, <laughs> I totally get it. And so from the other side, from the real job in quotation mark world, my advice is always, always, always focus on your passion and your network. And so hmm. don't focus on, I want this job at this company, or I want to get out of here. Just find what makes you super excited because when your excitement is genuine, people respond to that. And, you know, we joke about it, but I do love conferences more than anyone in the world, I think. And you know, setting them up, running them, going to them, whatever it is. I love collaborating with other people and finding out what they're doing and seeing competitors as people I can work with and not the competition. And I think 
you know, really focusing on that and just trying to help the industry in any way that I could, whether that is in your local area, it could be just helping to run a group of school directors in your local city or area. It could be getting, maybe you're in a, a rural area. Maybe there's one other ESL school or international ed program. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's abroad programs that are sending kids abroad. Maybe you connect with that director, but anyone that you can connect with, whether it be on a national scale or really, really local, the more that you do that, the more opportunities come to you. And, and that would be my advice is be open to anything. Say yes. You know, if you haven't listened to or read the book, Shonda Rhimes book on the year of yes, absolutely recommend it. Say yes to things that scare you, but get out there and just follow your passion and get to know people because that's how the opportunities come. I, I love that advice. And I, I noticed that throughout your career, you've taken the initiative on a number of things. You started your own school in Spain, you, you know, you organized a conference in your local area. And I, and it's obvious that that has led to things. So I would say, I love that advice. And if you're out there listening, and especially if you think, you know what, what we need is X, just do it. Just that's do it. it. Even if it doesn't that's work, it. who cares? You tried. Yeah, right? that's it. When I moved to Boston, I was so surprised that I could see 10 competitors from the door of my building. 10. I mean, we had all the big names here, right? Until this year. EC, EF, ELS, ELC. You could see everyone. And they were all within a five block radius, you know? And yeah. In Madrid, all of us center directors, we would collaborate. We would see each other at the same events all the time. We would, you know, and maybe I offered TOEFL classes, but I didn't offer IELTS or TOEIC. Someone could come in and say, hey, I'm looking for a class to, you know, for my brother. It's much better business to say, you know what, we don't offer that, but hang on, I have a really good colleague that does. Let me give them a call. Then to say, yeah, sorry, we don't do that. Good luck. That's so you know, interesting because we I, each other. <laughs> exactly. I, I think, you know, and I, I'm thinking about um, my time when I was a director of studies mm -hmm. here in Los Angeles. I really wanted to do something like that. Yeah. My boss was very against it because of the competition. The competition. The competition. <laughs> but I mean, gosh, look where we are now. We're all sort of in the same situation mm -hmm. when you think about it. Absolutely. Um, and how do you think we all got that we all worked together to lobby to get the crazy SEVP guidance from last summer? blocking international students reversed. We all did that because the yeah. advocacy of everyone together achieved that goal, you know, and that's what can happen. And so that was my biggest confusion when I moved here was that people in the Boston area weren't talking and exactly what you said after complaining about it for a couple of years, I said, well, you know what, if no one else is going to do something about it, I'm going to do it. Exactly. And yeah. I'm lucky enough to have some really good friends that I had made in the industry here that were willing to take this insane leap with me and do that. And, um, and, and Joy, yeah. is this, uh, <laughs> are you talking about Matsol, put, putting that organization together? A couple of things. So Matsol existed, but it was very K-12 heavy. So a lot of WIDA, Common Core, you know, and so we would go and send our employees and it was like, you know, none of the sessions really applied to us. And it's kind of chicken and egg, right? Like if no one's submitting sessions, well then of course nothing's gonna, gonna apply to us. And so why would we go? And so one thing that we did was get together all of the Boston directors in the Boston area and start just getting together on a regular basis. And the other thing um, was a group of friends and I approached the, approached the Matt Sala organization and said, we'd like to run a conference for private language schools. We understand that you see us as a business, even though we are also educational, we would like to do this through you. And so, and they said, okay. And so, yes, we did that. And, um, and that is eventually actually how I ended up on English USA board was that I met people from that and then they liked that. And there you go. And that's where I met my current boss. Oh, so, cool. <laughs> and Matsol stands for Massachusetts Teachers of English to Speakers of Other Languages. It's the Massachusetts TESOL. Great. Amy's mm -hmm. really great on these calls because she's <laughs> from a completely different industry. So she's what are very all these good. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. You know, yep. I thought about doing a quiz where it was like name the English language teaching acronym because there's just so yeah. many of them. But <laughs> yeah. um, now I want to get into this year. This has been mm-hmm. a really challenging year and Absolutely. I've been very interested in hearing your perspective because we've spoken to teachers and we've spoken to some administrators. We've spoken to some small yeah. business owners. And so I'm just wondering how it's been for you uh, what your experience on the more publishing and marketing side has been like. Yeah. I always used to speak to my friends in publishing and say, what happens to me at a school happens to you. I don't understand why you don't kind of follow the trends as much as you guys should. Like what happens to me happens to you six months later. And that's absolutely true. I mean, and I think that's true of anyone Um, accrediting bodies, insurance companies, you know, the gardeners, et cetera. Any of us that are providers to the English language world obviously are affected when there's an 85% enrollment drop, right? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Obviously those things are, and when teachers are suddenly struggling and administrators and academic directors are struggling to figure out how to get materials to kids, so are we. And so you know, I think our role in all of this was to try to figure out how can we pivot, how can we make sure that people have what they need so that every day we can all still get up and remember why we're doing this, which is to Mm. make that student feel like even if they're across the world right now and stuck and so frustrated, we, the end game is to make that student feel like they're learning and like they love what they're doing and to help them, those teachers feel like they can still do what they know how to do, even though now they're learning to do it in a very different way. And so it's been really amazing. This morning, I actually am coming right out of our end of year town hall with the global entire organization oh, wow. celebrating this morning. Just how cool how how amazingly kind of uplifting it was to see everyone just put a smile on their face and remember why we're doing this and you know surveying customers saying what do you need you know and it went from in March figuring out like oh my god do you have an ebook how do I share it how do I put it on zoom what do I do can I put it on zoom can I share it how do I work zoom do codes work in China can they activate a code in Taiwan can how do I sell a book to someone in Bhutan you know (laughs) and all of that to now kind of okay now we're in that we, we know what we're doing but how do we keep these kids engaged? How do we keep them motivated? We're all sitting on Zoom 12 hours a day. How do we make this fun, you know, and kind of helping everyone to kind of get to that next point. Like what's the next benchmark that we need to kind of figure out? And so there's been that. And, you know, I feel very, very fortunate um, watching just, you know, around me and in the industry, it's, it's a, it's a scary time. It's, It's horrible to watch so many of my peers you know, and my former peer organization shut down. It's horrible to see all of these chains just pulling out of the United States. It's horrible. And I know that it's due to many years of one hit after another. This wasn't, it's not all COVID. It's Saudis pulling out. It's, I mean, the amazing international PR we've had, you know, (laughs) whatever your political interests are, this has not been outstanding for international education by any means. Yeah, Um, you know. Oh, I was going to say, that's an interesting point. Cause I remember, you know, Melanie, you worked for a, a bigger school and yep. you were starting to see mergers and acquisitions mm-hmm. and changes to that organization last year, um, right before COVID. Mm-hmm. So yeah. what, what, if you can just tell the, tell the audience, what were a couple of other contributing factors, um, aside from COVID that you think impact it, impacts, uh, the ESL? Yeah. The international ed market in the USA has, kind of, it's been on a decline already. You know, first there were some nationally funded students from other countries that used to have large, large, large amounts of money behind them where their governments were funding them to come and study here. They were up to 40% of the market at times. Um, Schools, you know, there are schools in the Boston area, for example, that have foot baths in the bathrooms because that's how high of a percentage their Saudi population was. And, you know, that is pretty much gone that was that had happened that was already a large hit and you know the administration has been very detrimental to the international ed community not only the um kind of the pr the messaging of 
closing borders and, you know, choosing specific groups of people to target and kind of, you know, make at times try to have visa restrictions on different groups of people um, and especially groups of people that are very high percentage <laughs> international students like China or the Middle East. But, you know, there's also just the things that have happened in the past few years when students are polled internationally, they say that they're afraid of the gun violence in the US there, you know, and things like that. So right now it makes complete sense if you before COVID were looking to learn you know, the American accent, which has become over the past 15, 20 years, kind of the ideal in many cases, um, you'd probably go to Canada where they have complete national programs trying to recruit more students. And I remember at NAFSA two years ago, hearing a panel from, I believe it was the BCIIE. I think I got that right. I don't know what that stands for, Amy. I'm sorry. I'm guessing <laughs> but it's it something like British, British Columbia yeah. International Education something. It's, it's something Canadian. Um, and they were speaking about how they were even, you know, looking into having special passport lanes in the major airports for students that had passport, you know, people working there that had training in ESL to make sure that the visa questioning was easier. Like, that's oh my like god that's opposite. amazing <laughs> that is almost the opposite if not the opposite of what we're doing I mean we have yeah. created an atmosphere that I would say is Absolutely. hostile to it international is, students it's a great way. I actually I had a breaking point myself I I teach a student uh via WeChat and and she's great we we talk almost every single day the day that the the ban on WeChat and TikTok was announced yeah. I actually I don't know it just got me at the right moment. And I ended up crying yeah. when I was telling her about it because yes. I felt like it was just another thing we were going to yes. have to do. One deal. more thing. And I remember uh, thinking that when I started seeing the news about COVID, I just, I remember thinking, oh, it's one more nail in the coffin. I had no idea at the time, obviously, but yeah, it's it's been a struggle. So there are a lot of international chains of ESL schools that immediately right at the outset we're like yeah that's it we're pulling out of the u.s that's the last you know the last like, straw thank yeah. giles stafford you know there there are many um yeah. but just seeing so many have to let people go so many professionals in this world that are just so i mean no one goes into this for the money you know people go into this because this is their passion and this is where they find other people that get it yeah you know that have those same weird experiences overseas that they do and <laughs> You know, and they want to spend their day trying to make sure that when people come here, that they're as well taken care of as we all were when we were that lost kid in an airport in a place that we didn't speak the language. And that's the thing we have to hold on to is that this will end and whoever is left standing, I I can't wait to help rebuild this industry. And I think there's oh, a lot of people that feel high, that way. Exactly. High five, high five. Virtual it's high five. Too. I cannot wait. It's coming too. I'm I'm very, I, very excited about it actually. Very me too, excited. Because there are a lot of people. And what scares me is the amount of people that have had to go get in quotation marks a real job just because they've been furloughed or because, you know, they're waiting it out. And the longer this goes on, you know, if you do find yourself in a different industry because you were waiting it out and you were furloughed or you're just waiting for them to reopen your school. And you do find those better benefits that are outside the industry. And I'm just afraid of the brain drain that those people are, aren't going to come back. And I'm scared of how many amazing professionals we're losing. And I, that, that does terrify me. I hope that that's not the case. So I hope that, you know, I, I do see a lot of people that have been furloughed that are still coming to regional NAFSA meetings. They're still coming, you know, to conferences. And I hope that continues. Keep those ties alive please keep keep your finger on the pulse of the industry because it will come back and I hope all of the amazing professionals do too so that's really interesting and as I'm listening to you talk I'm feeling like there mo this is a very emotional interview for me I feel like it's inspiring in parts and it makes me sad in other parts because I really agree with what you're saying um what was that <laughs> kind of sums up the year. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. What I was going to 
ask, I personally, you know, as you're talking about this sort of nail in the coffin, what is going through my mind is sort of this like death and rebirth sort of thing, because I believe mm -hmm. that we're actually, it feels really grim mm -hmm. and you've, you've really touched on a lot of reasons that, you know, we've had an openly hostile environment to international students for really the past four years. We've had COVID, you're absolutely right. Government policies can decimate a school overnight, but I feel like in spite of that grimness, we are actually on the precipice of some very oh, yeah. exciting things. Yep. And if we can just hang on a little bit exactly. longer, we're going to see it start happening. So I hope so. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if I want to ask you right now where you kind of feel you are right now or what you think the future has in store. I'm going to leave it to you. What would you like to talk about next? Where I am in what sense? Like personally with this or professionally? Yeah, where, you, or? where you feel professionally yeah. things are right now. I think um, for most of us, I think whether you're a teacher, a school director, a marketing person for a publishing organization, your job has changed this year. You are not doing in your day to day what you were doing last year at this time. I normally am on the road every other week, every three weeks at the, at the most, um, hitting different conferences, visiting customers, running events. I haven't been on a plane since I think February 27th. Yeah, me too. <laughs> That's really odd for me yeah you were actually at the very last event that i was at and i am amazed that we all escaped from that unscathed now that oh, i, I, I <laughs> have thought that so many times in new york end of yep. february 20, 2020 at a conference yep. we were in crammed a into a little bar hours. afterwards yep and yeah it's amazing we're a hugging we're industry very lucky. so yes yeah. very lucky and very lucky and you know and just thinking well things have changed. You know, that, that was a huge part of my job was just being out there and getting to work with customers and sales teams and, and running our sales meeting, which was in a different location and flying people in for that. And everything, uh, all of those things are now on zoom. And so definitely my day is very different. I also have learned a lot about eBooks that I did not know. <laughs> Um, way more than I think I ever wanted to know, but man, are they cool. And I think it's just, you know, just like everyone has learned how to do their job in a different way. I think that's true of all of us. And I think that kind of tying it to the future part, I think that there's a lot of things I think that a lot of us wanted to do, but didn't have time, right? Like I know many schools have always thought it would be an amazing idea to have a hybrid program. I know many schools that thought this. I know my former school thought this. Wouldn't it be great if we had a program where a kid could study for a while at home in their home country, do a couple levels, and then come to Boston and do some in-person class? Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, well, guess would, what? Yeah, That's not going to go away now. That's Absolutely not going to go not. away. And tomorrow, those schools in Boston are not going to have to close and have agents who sent a kid for two weeks angry that they paid for a school for two weeks when now for the next two days, there's no way to get there. You know, we used to go crazy thinking, oh my God, should we close? It's not safe for people to go because it's snowing so much, but, but these kids are only, we have a Chinese program here for, and they're only here for 10 days or, or five days. What do we do? And now that's not a problem because if you're in your host family, that's already an immersive experience. That's amazing. And now, okay, hop on, on, do your class and yeah, you'll go back in another day. These things that we've had to do, this is, I mean, this is a good thing. There's so many good side parts of this that we get to keep that are going to enhance what our original jobs and our original products. And, and I think that's a wonderful thing. I think that, you know, luckily, I think for the U.S. market, um, while there was a lot going on these past few years that was not great, the only Hollywood way it's hasn't, up. <laughs> I know, and Hollywood luckily hasn't changed. We are still the superpower in the Hollywood sense. And so we are still the image that people have in their minds. They want to see a yellow bus. Oh, they want to come here. And 
it amazes me. I my my husband actually is a writer and a teacher. Mm-hmm. He works for a language school that has thus far survived. Yes. And in spite <laughs> in spite of the difficult environment in spite of COVID, in spite of agents literally suggesting to students, you know what, maybe you should think about Canada instead. And Mm -hmm. I know that that is happening. Mm -hmm. There are still students coming here, which tells me they really want to be here, that there, there's a group of people who really want to come here. They do. And I think between here and the Canadian market, Canada, I think, will recover a little bit faster just because politically yeah. they're, they're ready and and some of their visa processing offices are already opening. And I know one opened in Brazil this week, and that's wonderful news. But both of these countries are going to bounce back for that reason. You know, this is the image that people have in their minds. And I'm hoping, having lived in Spain during La Crisis, the recession that started in, in 2008, and really knocked the Spanish government and and um, and economy for a loop. I watched a city where you know there are restaurants that say Hemingway ate here, you know, in Madrid. And I mean these these locations, some of them have been around for hundreds of years. And I watched so many of them close. But you know, all of a sudden, in the past few years, you'd go and and you'd see all these brand new places opening, new restaurants, new shops, new everything. And I just am really hoping that what's going to happen with restaurants, with schools, <laughs> is, is kind of what I saw in Spain. And I know it's not the same thing having, you know, had an entire pandemic, but people are resilient. And if any industry has been resilient and knows how to hang in there, it's this one. So <laughs> I definitely think that watching kind of things start to flower and come back to life will be an amazing thing. And I do think that it'll happen. You know, I, I think we just, we just have to hang on, like you said, a little bit longer. I also think this industry really needed to change. I, I feel, I, I have felt that way from, and I've said this on a number of the interviews we've had that like in some ways, this industry has always been a little bit behind the times and needed to adapt to the times. So I think this has been a very difficult time, but I don't think it's entirely bad. You know, I, I, I think some yeah. of these changes need to happen exactly like what you said, you know, hybrid. It would be great if we could get something here in the U.S. where students, when they got their student visa, were not obligated to spend 15 hours or more in a classroom. I mean, I understand why that happens, and it's fine if there's 15 hours of instruction needed but I think the freedom and the flexibility that a hybrid model offers is so attractive to students. So what are some of your predictions for the future? What do you think? I mean, maybe you kind of touched on them, but. Yeah, I think, um, fingers crossed, vaccines. And I think, you know, flight patterns coming back to normal, flights being put back between different cities and, and the new administration reopening visa processing in the major embassies. Like I said, I think that this is still an ideal that people have in their minds of the goal that they have and, and where they, they want to see themselves learn and prepare for the next chapter in their lives. And, you know, I think there are many people over here ready to help them do that. And I think whether it comes to, you know, schools or the people preparing the materials for the schools, I think you're right that you know, a lot of things are changing and they're becoming more modern and more up to date. And I think we that will just continue. I do think that the hybrid model will continue. I think that schools will continue to be able to offer programs to students around the world in addition to students that are in person. And that can only help, you know, because it can only help every student. I always think we are saving the world in the sense that if you're in the classroom, if you're running a school, if you're helping to, you know, provide a service to any of those schools, when you have a group of people from 20 different cultures, 15 different cultures in a room, whether it be a Zoom room or a real room physically, and they're exchanging ideas, they will walk away from that experience, whether it was a week or a year of their lives and be able to help change the world around them. They're not, they're going to hear someone say, well, you know, I don't like people from wherever because you know, they do. And they'll say, no, 
I studied with people from wherever. And that's not actually true. Let me tell you about my friend so-and-so. Amen. And so Love it. little by little, kid by kid, adult by adult, <laughs> class by class, we are helping these people to become agents of change. And so times like what we've just lived through, not, not referring to the pandemic, but where walls go up and borders are closed will stop happening. That's what I have to keep telling myself. That's why I get up every day. You know, and whether I'm in the classroom or running a school or now over here trying to help, you know, I know that I fully believe in the things that we create, the materials we create where I work, because they're all about being global citizens. They're not selling a blonde woman in Milwaukee making pancakes with a golden retriever. <laughs> they're selling images of people all over the world. So a kid can open a book and go, hey, that looks like me, or hey, that looks like my dad. Or on, in chapter five, that's about my country. And that's why I get up in the morning because I know that we are helping little by little by little. And it'll take years, it'll take generations, but I think we are helping, I hope. That's awesome. I think you've just nailed why so many of us go into this industry too, by the way. <laughs> so yeah. thank you for that. Wow, I was going to say something. It was really profound and it has I'm left ready. my mind. I'm, well, no, it's, it's left my <laughs> mind. So oh, I'm no. actually going to turn it over to you and ask if you have any other final thoughts. That was beautiful. But. Yeah, I have to say, very inspiring. I really love the way you summarized the importance of uh, international communication and the respect that gets built in an international classroom, like like an English learning classroom. It's it's really important. I'm not in the education industry, but I am in an industry that is an international industry. And so I apply a lot of the learnings that I had as a, as a language student yeah. um, to that about understanding that there's different perceptions and cultures and, and, yeah. uh, you know, and I give 10 extra points to anybody who's uh, working in English, if that's not their Absolutely. native language, and they're working with me. So <laughs> that was very inspiring. Thank you. I'm glad. I think it's, you know, it's, I've lived it, I've experienced it. And to be able to turn around and help, whether it was the part of my career where I was helping to create that environment for other people. Um, and now I'm, I'm a step removed from it, but helping people that are helping to create that environment for other people. It's, it's amazing to be able to do that. Super cool. I, I remember now what I was going to say, two things. Okay, ready. One, <laughs> when I was in my 20s, right after 9-11, I was at a party and a friend of mine, who I believe was like 19 at the time, said, you know what? I think that we should force everybody to go abroad. You can choose the country, mm -hmm. but you have to spend like three months to a year abroad in a different country. And I still think that was a brilliant idea. She was really on to right. something. She's right. The other thing is with, you mentioned walls and it reminded me of what another friend of mine said about a year ago. The thing about walls is that they keep other people out, but they also mm -hmm. keep you in. Um, and so. Yes. Yeah, I've I, never felt as claustrophobic in my country as I do right now, not being able to go anywhere. I know. Isn't it? Isn't it it's so crazy. It's, it's so crazy. You're that's right like, about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I must say that's, that's something I've been enjoying about all of these interviews. I feel like I'm having little round the world trips, but I hear yeah. you. Um, my, my husband has uh, got me watching the Michael Palin around the world series. It's, it's my vicarious traveling and I'm really enjoying it. I love it. <laughs> Your friend was right. Um, I was teaching, I was the, I think I was the center director of Geos um, Sprach Cafe Boston, which is where I met your friend Caroline, in when the marath the Boston Marathon bombing happened. But I was also teaching. I had the advanced group of our students and it was a very international group. We had kids from all over in the class. It was a group really, they'd been, they were the year long kids. So they, they had really bonded by April when it happened. And when we got back in the classroom, originally before the FBI figured out who it really was, they had targeted an apartment of two Saudi students in Revere, Massachusetts, thinking it may be them. When we got back into the classroom, um, one of our Colombian students asked Fahad, who was a Saudi student, he said, hey man, are you mad? Like, are you pissed off that, you know, they just automatically went for you guys? <laughs> and, you know, and Fahad was giving his reaction, you know, and, um, you know, and I thought it was great that, that his classmate had felt comfortable enough to ask the question. 
And, you know, and he was honest about it and he wasn't really angry. He was like, no, I, you know, blah, 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 blah. And Pablo, the student, he, he said, you know, well, I was really angry and my mom was telling me how I shouldn't be hanging out with you right now because it might be dangerous. And, you know, she's in a small town in Colombia. She's never left the small town and, and, you know, and that's not her fault, but I feel like now I'm studying here and I know you. And I just, I told her like, no, like he's my friend and he's an amazing person. And he's been there for me. And I don't know how much we got done that day in class, but I will never forget that conversation because that was to me, that was exactly why we do this, you know, exactly. was that this student then turned around and said, no, that's not what the world looks like. You, you're wrong. <laughs> and that yeah. I, it will stay with me forever. Amazing. And the truth is those of us who've worked with Saudi students know that they're generally oh. like the most relaxed oh, yeah. people you could ever meet. Yeah, <laughs> no, and it was, out. it's an example, you know, you know it yeah. was just that, that in that specific case, that was kind yeah. of the very first assumption by her. Obviously, I'm sure they had their reasons, but the FBI, but, you know, so it's an example. It's just, it, it's one that stuck with me always. Very powerful stuff. So where can we find your work, Joy? Well, no, your <laughs> products. You're the product manager. Ah, yes. Oh. Uh, yes. You can find any National Geographic learning products at eltngl.com. Eltngl.com. Yep. Joy, thank you so much. This has been a really amazing conversation. I've loved it. I've loved having you. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. It was an honor. Yeah, thank you. Come on, baby. Let's keep in touch. Come on, baby. Let's keep in touch.